Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those who are here in person, as well as those who are joining us online. Welcome to this uh, symposium, uh, very important symposium on emerging and re-emerging infections. Uh, few housekeeping announcements very quickly. Um, uh, if you have any mobile phones, please switch them uh, off or keep them on silent mode. Uh, each speaker has 20 minutes and uh, a board will be shown at 5 minutes and 2 minutes. And uh, the whole session, uh, the maximum time allowable, uh, will, uh, since we are running late, is actually 1 hour and 20 minutes. And uh, uh, all participants who are joining online, uh, your microphones will be muted. But uh, we encourage you to ask questions through the chat. And uh, we can take those questions depending on the time uh, after the speaker presentations, but if not, definitely at the end. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's start this uh, important uh, symposium, uh, especially during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic on emerging and re-emerging infections, the uh, local as well as the global scenarios and we have three eminent speakers uh, in specialists in infectious diseases, public health and uh, clinical medicine. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Malik Peris, uh, who is professor and chair in virology at the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in uh, the during the time of the SARS epidemic uh, in uh, uh, you know uh, finding out about the uh, pathophysiology as well as uh, suggesting about uh, measures for prevention and control. And uh, again, in this time period, he has been instrumental it, uh, and uh, in a lot of efforts as well as. Uh, he has worked very closely with SLMA and is a good friend of SLMA uh, and has participated in several sessions, webinars related to the COVID-19 pandemic. He is a clinical and public health virologist with a particular interest in emerging viral diseases and the animal-human interface. So to speak about emerging and re-emerging infections, the global scenario, I uh, humbly and uh, warmly welcome Professor Malik Peris, who will be joining online. Uh, hello. Good, uh, good evening, and uh, I'm happy to be with you. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, I think, very appropriate that we have a session on emerging and re-emerging infections at this time, when, of course, we are all consumed by, I would say, the most uh, drastic uh, and devastating emerging infection for the last 100 years, which is COVID-19. So um, if you just go back a bit into history, uh, at the end of the 19th century, there were really major scientific advances in infectious disease. So the germ theory of uh, infectious disease was firmly established by people like Louis Pasteur and Robert Bock. The antibiotic era was born uh, and there were many interventions uh, for treatment, uh, vaccines were developed. So by the 1950s and 60s, uh, it was generally um, believed and uh, confidently asserted that infectious diseases are well under control and that uh, medical research should be now focusing on other things, uh, the conquest of cancer and stroke and heart disease, et cetera. But um, even at that time and uh, before, there were people who were really pointing out that uh, this type of hubris uh, and arrogance of humans is rather, uh, rather uh, unwise uh, because Rini Dubois, um, a, a microbiologist and a philosopher, uh, he, he made this statement sometime in the 1950s. He said that the idea of humans conquering infectious disease is doomed to failure because as he said at some unpredictable time and in some unforeseeable manner nature will strike back 
And indeed, uh, although today we are talking about infectious disease, I think this statement is really valid for many other aspects uh, in which we humans are really uh, devastating nature. And I'll come back to this. Um, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, infectious diseases are striking back. Uh, you just had a talk about HIV AIDS and you know, this is a completely new disease which was not known uh, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, antibiotic resistance uh, is a major problem now. Uh, there have been other outbreaks of things like bird flu. We had SARS in 2003, more recently outbreaks of Ebola, Zika, and uh, when I give this talk uh, last year, I had this bit uh, which comes in to say, what is next? And I would then say that, uh, that if you just go back over the past two or three decades, every two or three years, we have had a major uh, emerging infectious disease and um, we, are, we are likely to have one. And of course, uh, unfortunately, that has proved correct. But this one uh, clearly is much more devastating because it's a respiratory infection spread very efficiently by the respiratory route and has gone global within a matter of weeks and months. So what, what is the definition of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases? Uh, and uh, I've put that up there. So infectious diseases that have newly appeared in the human population. So these are new infectious diseases or uh, existing uh, infectious diseases that are rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic distribution. So for example, um, multidrug resistant tuberculosis or tuberculosis in general uh, may qualify for the second category. Uh, this map just shows you some of the um, infectious diseases that have been emerging over the last uh, few decades. And uh, you can see that all across the world, they have come, uh, they have emerged uh, all over the world, but uh, there are a couple of common themes. So most of them are zoonosis, meaning they come from animals to humans. Um, most of them are caused by RNA viruses. And this is because RNA viruses generally have a higher mutation rate, which means they can adapt much better when they cross species from one animal species to another. And in, in this case, to humans. Uh, this cartoon uh, illustrates how uh, these infections arise from animals to humans. Uh, of course, there are many infections that are endemic in humans. Uh, those we are familiar with and we have uh, approaches to deal with them. I'm talking about measles, chickenpox, uh, polio, etc. But what we are talking about today are these completely new infections that come, as I said, mainly from animals to humans. And of course, in the animal kingdom, uh, there is a huge diversity of infection. Uh, so uh, in the domestic animals, which are more closer to humans and we have much closer interaction with them, they have their own uh, pathogens. But beyond that, in the wild animal kingdom, there's a huge diversity. I mean, millions and millions of viruses out there. Now, luckily there are species barriers which don't allow these viruses to cross from one species to another uh, or to humans. But from time to time, there are spillovers and uh, you have um, uh, outbreaks of zoonotic disease, uh, for example, which um, and avian flu H5N1, uh, MERS, which comes from camels to humans, Nipah, Ebola. These are all examples where there's a spillover from animals to humans. And sometimes there is some limited human to human transmission. And of course, in Ebola in 2014, that was quite extensive. Uh, but ultimately, it was brought under control. But then in a much fewer number of instances, you have a situation where one of these viruses becomes adapted to more efficient transmission in humans and takes on a life of its own transmitting in humans. And then, of course, it can spread worldwide. So influenza pandemics are examples of these. Uh, these are not, this is not the seasonal influenza that we have every year. I'm talking about pandemics, which are less frequent. So the last pandemic was in 2009. SARS uh, is an example, which is a coronavirus. Then of course, SARS coronavirus two, uh, which is the COVID-19 virus. Um, we talked about Zika. And I just also want to point out that uh, when we talk about coronaviruses, there are a number of 
endemic human coronaviruses, such as the common cold coronaviruses, uh, 229E and OC43. And uh, these viruses, now we know, uh, we can track them, that they also emerged into the human population fairly recently, only two or 300 years ago. So that means a few hundred years ago, there have been coronaviruses that jumped from animals to humans and have spread worldwide because these viruses are now endemic. Luckily, they are quite mild, but we don't know at the time when they initially jumped to humans, whether they were as mild or uh, whether they caused more serious outbreaks at that time. Now, um, this movement from vi of these viruses from animals to humans is what concerns us. But when, if you take, for example, the pandemic, 2009 swine flu pandemic, it came to hu humans from pigs, as the name suggests. And as the virus spread worldwide, the virus then also went back from humans back into pigs. Um, and, and this has happened everywhere in the world. It did, indeed, it happened in Sri Lanka as well. We, we had a collaborative study with a PhD student, um, uh, which clearly showed that happening. Um, and uh, and th this has also happened less, um, less widespread, but it has also happened with COVID-19. So for example, COVID-19 does uh, infect pets, cats and dogs, for example, it has infected mink, mink farms uh, in Europe, a number of uh, countries uh, where, they, where they farm mink for, for, for fur uh, have been affected. And uh, on at least a few occasions, the infection has gone back from the mink back to humans as well. So this is a, a, a sort of an interface between animals and humans that we need to be aware of. Uh, this is another way of looking at this chart. So again, um, I'm talking about on the left-hand side, viruses that are found in animals, uh, wild animals, which may spill over sometimes into intermediate hosts, which may be uh, livestock. Uh, it may cause outbreaks in livestock, which is of course of economic importance. And either directly from um, wild animals or from livestock, it may come to humans. So by understanding these, um, we can try to intervene uh, upstream before the, the virus spills over into humans. The economic impact of these uh, infections, emerging infections is huge. So if we just take the example of SARS in 2003, the global economic impact was of the order of 40 billion US dollars. Uh, that's with a B. However, the current COVID outbreak uh, or the COVID pandemic puts all of these uh, in the shade because we are not talking about 40 billion, 400 billion, or even 4,000 billion. We are, we are really now talking about trillions of uh, uh, US dollars of economic impact. A trillion, as you recall, is a thousand billion uh, US dollars worth. So it, 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 it really has had a huge uh, economic social, uh, political as well, impact globally. What are these, what are the reasons for these uh, continued emergence of infectious diseases? And there are many, and essentially most of them have to do with humans. The first, of course, is to do with the microbe itself. And this is because uh, microbes, particularly I talked about RNA viruses, because they are so adaptable, they can mutate much uh, faster they can adapt to, uh, to different hosts, uh, such as humans. But then most of the others on this list, all the others on this list, are really our own human activities. So ecological disturbances, uh, encroachment into um, uh, uh, ecosystems, environmental factors, animal husbandry practices, uh, where we now have massive scale uh, 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 livestock uh, raising, which is on the scale of thousands. And these animals may be raised in one place, transported hundreds or thousands of miles uh, for marketing in other places. So all these provide uh, great opportunities for infectious diseases, uh, viruses, for example, to establish uh, and then be, be spread uh, over large distances. The pet animal trade. I mean, you might think this is a bit strange, but I will show you some examples as to how widespread uh, this pet animal trade is, uh, and how that can be important as a source of emerging infections. International travel is obviously important. Uh, I mean, COVID-19 traveled across the world because of um, uh, the, the, the massive uh, 
frequency of international travel, international trade, and then of course human behavior and demographics is also important, as well as some other things such as breakdown of public health. So these are all, as I said, uh, uh, things that we humans do um, to, to change our environment uh, and our interactions. So you might say, uh, is it actually true that the, the number of these emerging infectious disease events have increased? And, and it is uh, true. So this is a study that was done uh, a few years ago where they went back about 40 years and looked at these emerging infectious disease uh, events and quantified them and showed that uh, from the 1940s up to now, there has been a real increase in these um, emerging infectious disease events. Uh, and this is because those factors that I told you about have changed very dramatically over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. And uh, this study also identified that uh, the most common emerging infectious diseases are viruses, for the reason I told you before, mainly RNA viruses, and the other being antibiotic resistance. Uh, this, uh, um, this figure shows you some of the hotspots, uh, again, from this study, where they after identifying the different factors that led to each of the emerging infections that they studied, they then tried to see where in the world the risk of such uh, uh, spillovers may be highest. Uh, and you can see they have classified it uh, under different uh, categories of emerging infections. Uh, on the top uh, left, you have zoonotic infections coming from wildlife. On the right top is zoonotic uh, coming from domestic livestock. Uh, below on the right is drug resistance and below on the left, sorry, below on the left is drug resistance and below on the right is vector-borne pathogens. So you can see that uh, certainly Asia uh, is a particular hotspot, uh, including India and Sri Lanka, for uh, spillovers from wildlife to humans, giving rise to emerging infectious disease, and also for vector-borne pathogens. And uh, as I said, some of the reasons are shown in this slide. So on the left-hand side, you, you just have the global population growth over the last uh, 500 years. So you can see going back uh, over the centuries past, the, the population increase was very gradual. And then over the last 50, 60 years, you can see the huge exponential increase in population. So this is one species uh, dominating uh, the, the environment. And invariably that gives uh, opportunities for a for a pathogen to exploit and, and spread in that species. On the right-hand side, you see the increase in travel. So uh, around now, we have about 1 billion people traveling on a yearly basis. Uh, uh, you see the increase in, in production of poultry, which of course is a good thing because obviously people have to eat, people need proteins. So clearly animal production is important, but uh, but there are also risks uh, in the way that we do large-scale animal production. Then we have issues like urbanization. So uh, the, the trend towards urbanization is uh, uh, inexorable, I would say. And uh, down there, you see the point that cities comprise 2% of the total land mass, uh, uh, but they use, they, they are, of course, on the positive side, generate 70% of our economies, but also generate 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions, 60% of uh, global energy consumption, and 70% uh, of global waste. But in regards to infectious disease, urbanization is uh, really uh, great for viruses to get about, as you can see with outbreaks, for example, in a city like New York with COVID-19. Now I talked about uh, pets. Now, uh, a study that was done a few years ago documented that over a 10 year period from 2000 to 2009, something close to 1.5 billion live animals were imported into the United States. Uh, many of these were wild animal populations. Uh, and some of these, of course, can introduce uh, uh, infections, uh, viruses in particular, from parts of the world where uh, they exist to other parts of the world where they, they don't exist. So I, just as an example, uh, some years ago, there was an outbreak of a virus called monkeypox, which is found in Africa, which is not found in, in North America. Uh, this was introduced into North America through importation of pets and caused an outbreak affecting a number of people. 
on the uh, right hand upper chart, you see the, the, the wildlife tra trafficking routes. So there is a lot of wildlife trafficking, which goes on for a number of reasons, uh, partly for pets, partly for medicinal purposes and, and, and other reasons. And uh, this, of course, has multiple problems. I mean, on the one hand, it's uh, uh, depleting biodiversity, leading to extinction of animal species. And on the other hand, it leads to uh, introduction of, uh, of uh, emerging infectious disease. Uh, as, as we will see, COVID-19 may have also emerged here as part. Uh, down here, now you see an example of this type of trafficking. So this is a, 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 a package that was intercepted in Brussels airport in Europe. And they found um, in, these, uh, in those containers there, there were two crested hawk eagles that were packed live and shipped. Uh, and it so happened when they tested these birds, they found that they were infected with avian flu H5N1. So this uh, leads us on to how SARS emerged in 2003. We, we now know that uh, the virus was present and is present. Uh, the parent virus is present in these small insectivorous bats called rhinolophus bats that you see there in the picture. Uh, the virus then moved from those bats into these wild animal markets, uh, which where wild animals are, uh, are, are housed for the, the game animal restaurant trade, which is um, um, it's a delicacy in southern China. The virus was introduced from bats to some of these other species that you see there, like civet cats. And of course, then because humans are continually being exposed to these huge uh, um, mixing of animals, uh, over and over again, humans got infected until finally the virus adapted to spread in humans. And then, of course, we moved to uh, international travel and the virus spread along air travel uh, all across the world. But luckily, that outbreak was contained. But you can see the pathways, how that emerged and spread. And in the case of COVID-19, again, uh, it's almost certainly a similar pathway that has taken place because we know that the virus is present in these same types of bats, uh, rhinolophus bats indeed. Now, whether it came directly uh, to humans or whether it again also went through these game animal markets is unclear. But, uh, you know, uh, these game animal markets were closed for some period of time in, in mainland China. Uh, and indeed they are illegal even up to now, but unfortunately um, illegal markets do take place and, and we don't know whether that was the actual source of emergence of COVID-19. Uh, we talked about animal husbandry and here we have an example of uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or, or what is popularly called cow disease, which is a prion disease. And uh, what, uh, what happened in the UK was that cattle, which as you know, eat grass, were, were fed with protein supplements that was uh, uh, obtained by, um, by homogenizing brain tissue, which is normally thrown off, off slaughtered cattle. And this was used as a protein supplement. And this led to the introduction of this prion agent, which then led to an outbreak in cattle, and then it spilled over into humans. Uh, the ecological and environmental factors that I talked about, um, for example, again, I'm just giving a few examples. Uh, this is the bushmeat trade where people hunt um, wild game animals and, and uh, including primates and chimpanzees and, and other, other monkeys. Uh, can and I we know that you? that is how uh, HIV emerged. Prof Malik, can I interrupt? Uh, uh, we are almost yeah, out sure. of time. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm almost finishing. So I think I just uh, end by emphasizing that in this situation, we really need to tackle these uh, issues in a multidisciplinary way. So uh, it's not just a matter of human health. We need to also uh, work together with animal health and environmental health. And indeed, uh, we had a uh, pre-Congress workshop on One Health uh, at these SLMA sessions in, the, in, in collaboration with the Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. So with that, I will end and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Malik, for that uh, introduction uh, uh, and a very good overview for the, of the transmission of emerging and re-emerging infections and uh, also uh, highlighting the 
economic impact as well as uh, discussing the reasons for emergence including travel, trade and livestock, uh, which uh, highlights the necessity for a multi-sectoral approach. Uh, we will uh, take the questions uh, at the end of the session. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Manuj C. Veera Singh. Uh, he is a professor in community medicine and the head of the Department of Community Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and the vice president of SLMA. And he has worked uh, very closely with government authorities in uh, managing the COVID-19 pandemic in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Prof. Manuj. Uh, thank you, Asela, and a very good evening to all of you. And uh, Professor Malik has given a very good overview of the re-emerging scenario across the globe. And I would uh, be looking from a public health perspective and how a public health response to be geared towards an infection prevention. As uh, Professor Malik elaborated uh, very clearly, uh, infections are not uh, new things to us. And, uh, and every couple of years we see an epidemic going on and which uh, sometimes uh, lead to pandemics and we have seen a pandemic now on the ground level. And this is a very known picture of the 1918 uh, Spanish uh, flu, I think, which was, uh, is coming back as uh, frames for all of us to look at. And as uh, was very clearly shown by Professor Malik in the previous uh, presentation, if you look at the last century, we have so many epidemics going on because of infectious agents, particularly pandemic uh, influenza in 1918. And after that, there has been recurrent infectious disease threatening the social nexus and the health sectors uh, across the globe for last 100 years. And if you look at the, this century, century for last uh, 20 years, we have seen at least three to four epidemics going at a global level, although not uh, maintained as pandemics. But in 20 years so now, we have COVID all across. So the issue we here that we need to tackle is that at any moment we can have an epidemic across the globe and it is inevitable therefore we need to tackle with those whenever we look at from a biomedical point of view on how we are going to react to infectious diseases generally three things come into mind when we are generally looking at to have an accurate diagnosis and a diagnostic test, then effective vaccines and successful treatment. It's a general way of thinking from a biomedical model that we are looking. And yes, indeed, these are very critical elements. However, looking at the nature of the epidemics and looking at the possibility of developing it to a pandemic, these three is not only adequate. There are others that we may have to look at seriously. For one reason is most of the times we don't have accurate diagnostic tests at the very beginning of emerging disease. Definitely no effective vaccines. It takes time and successful treatment takes time for us to develop. Therefore, it's extremely important to look at from not these as individual experiences of person when it comes to an infectious disease but it's as a large issue where there's impact on whole segments of population across countries across borders and maybe when it comes to a pandemic across the globe and these have are generating so much of negative consequences across the globe and it is actually destabilizing social systems and structures. It's very evident at this particular moment, for last four and a half months, we, will, we have seen even the most economically uh, stable countries, how they are finding so difficult in tackling an uh, infective agent like SARS-CoV-2. So it's extremely important for us to look at social systems and structures and how are we going to strengthen them 
to face these challenges. So successful responses must include certain things. Particularly, we need to look at implementation of societal level responses that are system-wide interventions, where you cannot look only at health because health is one system which is affected by pandemics and endemics. And that is where the real need for global health and public health responses come in because the public health response will tackle issues beyond small or communities. It will tackle infectious diseases beyond individuals. When you are looking at public health response, as I told you, even wealthier countries is trying, struggling against COVID at the moment. So the preparedness is a key to whole business. So why preparedness is so important, particularly in infectious diseases? The decision making in such instances are very difficult, basically because we have incomplete information even about the pathogen. We do not know the things that would co come up. We do not know the extent of the issues. And definitely we are less aware about the effectiveness of the response measures that we generally apply. And so the plans has to be adapted to actual situations, the actual context. So there are no cross across uh, global solutions, the solution sometimes has to be tailor-made to the context that we are dealing with. And there are definitely competing demands, even in the health sector and with the other sectors because of less resources that we have. And in an emergency like this, the resources would be scarce. So, and one very important thing which we saw in COVID also, decision makers often face political scrutiny. Because decision makers, if you are the technical people, the technical issues has to be palatable in the political environment. And the pressures from the media and public is enormous. So the decision makers have to be really, really prepared to tackle with the problem. Unless we have that ability, we will be in a very difficult situation when the things are evolving very fast, the events are folding very fast. If you are looking at the literature which comes very recently, there are several models people use to actually think about the preparedness and assess preparedness across the globe. This uh, paper which came just a couple of months, Oppenheimer and others, came with this epidemic preparedness index looking at five domains from public health infrastructure, physical infrastructure, institutional capacity, economic resources and public health uh, communication under sub themes, they have looked at different ways how a country is prepared to deal with epidemics. They have actually converted this to a mathematical model and a scope. And uh, this particular tool is very important because when it applied to 188 countries back in last year, they have shown that this course of preparedness has a very wide range. And that range shows that how ill-prepared we are in certain countries and even countries which are well-prepared are still struggling in this issue. So having a preparedness and regularly updating is, I think, extremely, extremely important. I would also introduce you, this is Had Haddon's matrix, which is actually used for injury prevention and uh, things way back from 1960s now used for infection prevention and to look at epidemic. Here, which we are looking actually integrating two commonly used epidemiological principles. What is epidemiological triad? Second one is levels of prevention. The Haddon matrix, if you look at human, agent, and the physical and socio-cultural environment very clearly states the importance of the epidemiological triad in breaking the transmission of an infection. On the rows, if you look at pre-event, event and post-event, it clearly comes with the primary, secondary and the tertiary 
prevention methods. So when we are looking from a system's angle and try to fill these, then we will see for each and every phase of an epidemic, how are we going to break the transmission chain of a pathogen from human, agent and psychosocial and physical environment. But there, there is a catch. You have to make sure just mapping is not adequate, but you need to have pre-preparedness resource allocation. So you have adequate resource to invest in a time of epidemic. And if you look at multi-sectoral uh, nature of this, we cannot forget the other sectors. Because one of the key things or major problems that we see, health is given the priority. Yes, it has to be given in epidemic, but we are forgetting there are so many other sectors that should really come in in a public health response. I'll give just two examples. In infectious disease as COVID that we are seeing, transportation is so important. If the transportation system is not developed, that we see in our country in Sri Lanka where the buses, trains, we know how people transport in the public transport. This be can become a major hub of transmission if we are not preparing our transport system to face an epidemic. The next one is migration. Look at what's happening in country. It's an important disease. The labor migration to certain countries have actually taken or brought uh, the infection into the country. So all these sectors has to be looked at very seriously when we are looking at the phase of uh, doing a response for public health. We just can't forget others and go only on health. The importance of next slide, which I'm going to show is that we are taking decisions at different levels, but to what extent are we analyzing our decisions regularly to see whether our decisions are correct? So this uh, model which was uh, just presented uh, by Sher and others just a couple of months back very clearly sh shows that epidemiological data is not the only cause to decide whether our interventions are really good or responsive. So you need to look at the epidemiological data, what the plus the socio-political environment and context when both are looked at and both are being considered that we would come with very good decisions to look at how to go forward. If not, we may fail. And we are seeing some of the places we, who have very good surveillance uh, methods in the world have failed in containing the epidemic because the social, political, cultural settings has not been taken into consideration with the epidemiological data in the decision model. <laughs> I would now go back to a bit of things. What we generally forget. In public health response, we have to really be straightforward and transparent. We have to avoid denial and we have to accept the fact that there are shortcomings, there are issues, but we have to be very clearly communicate these risks to the population. The people, finally the people are the, uh, the, uh, the population is the main target of us. So the public health people and the public health response has to admit and transform and, uh, and actually communicate the actual risk. That is where the credibility comes in. When we do that, we could improve the collaboration within sectors and even with non-health sectors and others. This collaboration makes people to think that and own solutions and not force solutions on people. When solutions are forced, the sustainability is unlikely to remain. I have shown a few uh, tools that have been used uh, recently and I will go in the next slide about the tools that, are, that we are using now are most likely the tools that we have used 100 years back even in the Spanish flu because the public health tools are based on 
several key concepts and those uh, steps does not change over time and i'll go to that slide next but monitoring and reflection of our actions is extremely important and we find that monitoring of the actions that we take in may not be happening regularly when we are not monitoring what we are doing or we are not reflecting about what's the feedback that we get on public health measures then we tend to fail this is an interesting slide if you look at the newspapers two months back and we have gone 100 years back to 18 1918 the headlines are the same if you look at 1918 the headlines is public places are ordered closed and if you can see two months back what were the newspapers across the globe no public gatherings don't come out of the houses and no cinemas and so on we are a mask we are talking about mask now but 100 years back they have used the same tools and uh, look at public notices and uh, makeshift hospitals and temporary shelters for patients but one thing remains if you look at the quarantine and disease prevention ordinances which started almost 100 years back are the same legal and policy tools that we used in public health at the moment what i've given here is the 1897 uh, ordinance of prevention uh, of disease in sri lanka 121 years back this is the same ordinance that we used at this po point in time for covid prevention okay i'll just uh, go back uh, come back to sri lankan context this is the epidemiological curve as for last week for one uh, for almost uh, four months in sri lanka and you could see that there are few peaks but it's fairly a flattened type of curve and if i'm going uh, to elaborate on it the sri lankan context we have been able to contain the epidemic within now 33 clusters and there has not been a free transmission across the country at all so how did we achieve that this is how i look at it and i just uh, published a paper in the journal of uh, uh, journal of uh, physicians in sri lanka where i have looked at it from six angles i would say that the whole public health response sri lanka achieved it based on these six first one is prevention of infections reaching the country that is why we closed the airports somewhere about four months back but before that we restricted visas and so on and port of entry then we contained the infection which was brought by our returnees within their selves by institutional quarantine and sometimes self-quarantine to make sure that it does not go beyond them to the community third one is uh, reducing social gathering and mobility of population and if you look at still schools are not operating major most of the educational centers are not operating because they, they were closed still most of the social gatherings are not there so these are the same measures we adapted 100 years back and detection isolation and treatment of cases it's general thing that all of us do Luckily, we had a good diagnostic test, which is PCR, real-time PCR that we are using. And uh, isolation and treatment of cases, I don't want to get, go into details. I have told that the containing of infection within the clusters was the real strategy that we used in Sri Lanka with a staggered relaxation of control measures. Although there were issues on staggered relaxation, some went more speedier than others, but we have been still able to contain the infection within. Here I'm just showing you the early public health measures according to dates that we have taken in this country from 26th of January up to 20th of March. Day by day, we have taken so much of steps in this country that actually prevented us uh, free spread of infection across the country the last slide here i am going to emphasize on a couple of things on not only sri lanka but across the globe we saw 
in the infectious time we are not properly handling the media and when we are in the public health response when we are not handling the media properly it could one side make a fear psychosis second stigmatization of the disease and maybe impinging on the privacy of people and then the issues of transparency when there is one or two real official uh, uh, official figures who are coming and telling the um, media the status it has some confidence building when 10 people tell 10 things to the media we find the people are not believing us community engagement to what extent have we been able to make people feel that it is their solutions not force solutions so we have not been able to give the ownership to people but we are forcing certain measures to them that is not best in public health the last two leaving not health uh, stakeholders now we are trying to get them into the picture and definitely human resource and training has to continue despite not having an epidemic and the last one i want to emphasize is overconfidence we should never ever be overconfident even if we have been successful in a situation because things can go wrong in no time we are seeing that again and again we are declaring it is over but next day next night we are seeing things coming back so this is what i want to share from the public health perspective and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, symposium and i would like to answer any questions later thank you thank you very much prof manuj uh, i think uh, you highlighted the necessity for uh, preparedness and not to be overconfident uh, next we have uh, professor saroj jayasinghe who is the chair professor of medicine at the university of colombo and one of the senior most consultant physicians at the national hospital of sri lanka he is also the academic director of the health development and research unit that conducts the postgraduate diploma in health development as you can see he has varied academic interests he was the first director of the medical education development and research center at the faculty of medicine and also the founder head of the department of medical humanities the first such department in sri lanka over to you prof saroj uh, thank you very much and uh, once again i must thank the slma for uh, inviting me to deliver this presentation uh, the topic i have is uh, preventing future pandemics exploring a planetary health response may i have the first slide please uh, the outline i am going to talk on three areas uh, okay right fine thanks uh, it's uh, firstly to identify the biological events uh, which uh, which made this uh, zoonotic infection become a pandemic uh, mentioned by prof malik uh, peris then uh, try to see the evidence at a planetary level and develop a model that will operate at a planetary level so we are actually going now from uh, country level uh, to what should the world be doing in relation to pandemics and is there a way how we can uh, think about uh, uh, this problem so the biological events uh, very simply you have a reservoir in the wild, wild animals then uh, it spreads in the wild animals and gets on to humans and from the humans there are local epidemics and they become a pandemic that's the usual biological pathway which you can show here so you have uh, the virus then getting on to humans uh, through several pathways it could be direct contact uh, doc prof malik mentioned some of these it could be direct contact when there's deforestation for example or through domestic animal domesticated animals or through wet markets which we see in uh, southeast asia where animals are brought live 
and there are several species there and as a result infection spreads from one species to the other and then you get on to the humans and from there you have local epidemics and these local epidemics ultimately become pandemics so you can see the pathway in that manner now what we what i have tried to do is to look at each of these in a bit more detail and uh, this was mentioned about the in case of uh, corona uh, the reservoirs in the bat but uh, the bats are supposed to have some special relationship with corona and there are uh, several species of uh, coronavirus which have uh, used the bat as its main vector uh, but there are other wild animals also who are uh, who are involved as vectors and uh, these will cause epidemics in wild animals and depends on uh, how they are the wild animal population is in a particular area and when there is uh, deforestation and when the area of the forest get restricted you will notice that there is a higher density of these animals and infections can spread faster once we have these epidemics going on you start having contact with humans and uh, these uh, contacts as i mentioned before are in three main areas that's uh, uh, through domesticated animals so the wild animals infect the domesticated animals like poultry or pets and then they get on to the humans or you come in contact with wild animals when there is civilization near forest so if there's deforestation and people go into the forest you will start being exposed that's number 2 and number 2 lower down is these wet markets which have become important in the case of sars and maybe even the case of corona in wuhan now subsequently there is a just because you come into contact uh, the humans won't get it unless there is a species jump uh, that's where the mutations of the virus are important so the characteristic of an rna virus is that they mutate and there is uh, recombinant errors and as a result uh, they are able to develop mutations which will help in uh, invading humans so that's what happened with uh, with uh, corona because the spike protein which was required for the virus to go and get attached probably came up during some of the mutations and then it was able to attach to the humans and cause disease right so this shows the initial part of the spread and these are some of the pictures which which are there just to show the magnitude and as you know these some of these are happening even in sri lanka and we have to be careful because uh, now Peradeniya has recently identified it in two years ago, uh, a bat which has a specific rabies virus. Gunnorua, some species which they have named as Gunnorua, whatever, right? So uh, the as uh, Prof. Uh, Mendis, uh, Prof. Uh, Malik Peris mentioned, animal husbandry is a huge, huge thing. You are talking of billions of animals, billions of animals. right and deforestation which is happening all over the world even in sri lanka and all over the world you would have heard about the amazon and so on and then these wild animal markets and hunting sri lanka also has hunting and uh, that's not something which i think we should be promoting but uh, we have quite a lot of hunting going on wild boar and so on and uh, i mentioned about the species jump and then humans get affected once the humans get affected you start to have local epidemics and these local epidemics would depend on concentration of people and that's where urbanization and uh, the urban concentration especially peri urban areas where 
uh, hygiene measures are very poor, you get uh, spread of infections. It can be within the household, then within the community, and then it spreads. And as you know, if you look at from a planetary point of view, more than 50% of uh, human species now live in urban areas. So the species is now in urban areas. And Sri, Kalam Sri Lanka, we are still not so urbanized, but we are rapidly getting urbanized. But China has, over the past 20 years, made some dramatic changes in its uh, in the way they plan their lives and urbanization is a huge uh, issue. Then uh, I, I want to introduce this concept of physical hyperconnectivity, which actually helped this whole uh, uh, epidemic to become a pandemic. And uh, it's not only the humans, the, the tourists, more than a billion, you're talking of millions of goods moving around, you're talking of so many hundreds and thousands of uh, aircraft moving around, which also can carry viruses, and you're talking of animals migrating, and very interestingly, uh, even the sky has viruses and bacteria floating, and uh, it's, there is basically a microbiome in the sky. If you really check the, uh, the, uh, the high atmosphere, there are bacteria and viruses floating. So all these are probably important when it comes to a planetary level. Remember, my task is to look at these from the level of the planet. And uh, in these next few slides, I will now try to look at this model and expand on it to get, uh, get an idea of the, the planetary level of uh, how it influences this simple pathway. So uh, virus in wild animals, I mentioned about uh, deforestation and how population pressures can promote deforestation and therefore promote the the epidemics in the wild animals. And these are pushed by certain corporate interests and commercial interests. Uh, you would have seen how in Brazil, uh, they're allowing uh, deforestation of the Amazon. And that's because the new president, he doesn't care about the, in Brazil, doesn't care about the Indians uh, or the Amazon as a forest. And they want it open for capital, open for trade logging and remove everything, grow some crop there, soybean, so that the soybean can be exported elsewhere. Then when it comes to the next set of domesticated animals and wet markets, again, wet markets is a cultural phenomenon. So at a, again, at a macro level, it's a cultural factor which is there in Southeast Asia of people having markets where they bring live animals and there are wild animals and they mix and infections can spread. So it's a cultural factor. And also we heard about poultry and the huge domesticated animal market or animal husbandry, which, uh, which can generate epidemics. So far, hasn't contributed much to uh, COVID, but in future, it's, if, if there is a virus which can get into poultry, we've had it because you're talking of billions and billions uh, birds getting affected. Now I want to tackle about uh, the next stage, that's it has come to humans. We discussed about the RNA virus, how it spreads to humans. Then we discussed about local epidemics in relation to urbanization. And I want to just uh, elaborate a bit on this uh, physical hyperconnectivity, which was uh, hinted by uh, Prof. Malik Piris. Uh, in his slide also, he showed how there's a convergence of uh, things which are really increasing the connectivity between, uh, between people 
and between places. Uh, I call this physical hyperconnectivity uh, because hyperconnectivity usually you talk of digital hyperconnectivity. And uh, this is, you're talking of billions of people moving around as tourists, right? You're talking of uh, animals, again, uh, animal feed and animals, uh, dead animals being moved around, again, millions of tons moving across continents. And you're talking of uh, transport of goods, again, containers, huge amounts, 20 million containers, making over 200 million voyages per year, right? And then you come to this interesting bit of information, where there, there, there's a hypothesis that not only the macro physical hyperconnectivity, at the minute level, we are having connectivity through the jet stream of air, and that's an intercontinental spread on global wind systems. And interestingly, this is a theory which is proposed by Professor Chandra Vikramasimha. You remember astrobiologist who is, talks about the germs coming from outer space. So he's trying to, he, his hypothesis is that there is a jet stream which probably explains some of the spread from Wuhan. Then there is uh, Italian studies showing that the COVID can in fact be present in polluting particulates. So you find the RNA in the particle, uh, PM10. And also they found the presence of the virus and the bacteria in the very high levels of the atmosphere. That's above the, what they call the boundary level. You're talking of kilometers above, uh, above the earth. So uh, the model now looks a bit more complicated because we have added hyperconnectivity. We've had urbanization. And you realize that urbanization is related to population pressures partly. Hyperconnectivity is related to trade. Trade in, in turn, it's determined by, to some extent, by corporate interests. And this process can be further expanded with influence of globalization. And in fact, there are uh, Navarro from John Hopkins. Uh, he, uh, his, uh, he has uh, written this paper on the consequences of uh, neoliberalism, which promotes globalization, and how that is affecting the response to the pandemic. Now, if you take those bigger determinants from that uh, diagram, it's, uh, these are some of them which I've taken. So you have a virus which, which has a biological factor of dividing very fast and having mutations. You have mobile humans, you have urbanization, population pressures, globalization, deforestation, and uh, hyperconnectivity. And it looks as if uh, the perfect storm has happened with uh, COVID-19. Because all these processes seem to have converged. They have converged and caused this perfect storm of a massive pandemic affecting all parts of the world. Uh, some have described this as a synchronous failure. So you are having several systems which have in fact failed at the same time. So in summary, uh, what I've done is to use the biological pathway and from the biological pathway to look at some of the determinants uh, which promote the pandemic at a planetary level, if I really 
looking at it from a uh, from the view of the planet and uh, try to develop a model which will explain now why do we do that because if you are looking at it from the point of view of civilization of the human civilization which way are we going because if this is what has happened to the species with a small rna virus within 3 months uh, does it mean that our priorities are wrong does it mean that our models of development are wrong does it mean that the way we are getting look uh, where the way we handle or relate to other animals the earth itself is wrong so uh, that's what i've tried to do in this paper and uh, some of these uh, ideas uh, are encapsulated in a paper which hopefully will come in the university of colombo review i wanted to honor my alma mater by talking about a new theory in that journal thank you very much thank you very much prof saroj and uh, again the important aspects like physical hyperconnectivity globalization urbanization all the uh, at a broader planetary level as prof saroj mentioned uh, has come together and uh, we have to uh, in dealing with this pandemic as well as in future emerging and reemerging infections uh and uh, prof saroj's uh, talk again leaves up with some very uh existential questions that we really need to uh, look into uh so i'd like to uh, now uh open the floor for discussion uh in person uh two of the resource persons are here and uh, prof marik peris is joining us uh online and if there are any uh, questions that have been sent through chat uh if uh one thing uh, i'd like to uh, one thing uh, i'd like to pose from uh, from uh, prof manuj is about uh, you mentioned that the uh, public health legislation uh, is also you know as old as or even older than the spanish flu so uh, what do you think are the requirements in legislation that needs to be enacted uh, again in a previous symposium there was talk about the state legislation and the federal legislation in the us uh, having contradictions so in that sense in preparedness uh in both in a local uh, aspect as well as globally actually if you look at global aspect we have international health regulations and what we are using at the still is the 2005 uh, version of it and uh, it actually gives a very good understanding of what's happening across and on the other hand uh, after the a 2003 actually SARS outbreak there is a committee who sat and looked at uh, what are the things of international health regulations that need change and how you could improve it particularly getting support from countries so that work is been done on the background if you look at the sri lankan context sri lanka is one of the oldest countries to enact uh, enact uh, legal uh, legal tools for basically quarantine and uh, disease prevention in a uh, event of uh, epidemic so it is way back as, as i told you uh, 1897 it's 123 24 years back and it has the core concept of public health embedded in that act what we need if you are looking at our country is to modify certain things to look at the pr- present context of include technology and new uh, techniques coming on prevention and so on so however we have managed uh, the sri lankan uh, issues within that very old legisl- piece of legislation and uh, and uh, because it gives uh, actually sri lankan context if you look at this, it gives provisions for uh, 
sending new regulations based on the ordinance. So that is why we were looking at new ordinance, uh, ordinance giving regulations to control things. And there are, uh, in addition, in the police penal code, there are conditions and provisions that could make uh, and use for help. So all these could converge uh, as uh, legal provisions and regulations. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, there was another question uh, from our online audience uh, from, uh, I think, Anuridhika. Uh, the question was, uh, in uh, brief, it was related to, uh, and it was to all the panel members, uh, that we haven't we haven't done that much and uh, you know globally as a community uh, particularly in relation to we have we have had uh, certain in the united nations we have had millennium development goals sustainable development goals but we haven't addressed uh, this uh, you know re-emerging and re-emerging infections how far have we addressed that in those sustainable development goals because uh, for us to have sustainable responses uh, how can we address three have we addressed this through the SDGs or how far or what more can we do? It's a very difficult question uh, from that angle, but we need to look at one issue Within last 30 or 35 years what we were looking at a global village that is the global political order but now we find that global village can uh, can be reversed in no time for just by a virus. So if you look at the travel, if you look at the uh, trade activities, if you look at most of the things could be reversed and the whole economic activity was actually shrinking and crumbling because of just tiny virus. So, as I to, as you told you, we have not looked at that aspect when we are looking at economic aspect, aspect of the globe and the connectivity and the travel. Yes, uh, there is a point uh, in that uh, question as I, I understand. Well, uh, I think uh, if you really look at the SDGs, I don't think anyone predicted <laughs> this to happen. But it can be captured with uh, with the disaster and response to disaster because I think that's there. Uh, but uh, with this COVID epidemic, there is rethinking on on the impact of this uh, pandemic on the SDGs and how we should respond. The countries should respond because everything has changed. Everything has changed. Uh. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof Malik, is there any uh, concluding remarks? Uh... Yes, I mean, uh, in, in, well, in response to this, that question, I mean, I think the, the global response, as was pointed out before, was the IHR, which was, as pointed out, enacted in 2005. Now, the, and that was, as was said, uh, as a response to SARS and, 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 the, re and, and the realization that a prop epidemic anywhere can be a problem everywhere. But the problem is that uh, these uh, IHR goals have been signed up to by almost every country, but have not been fully implemented. Uh, meaning, if you, if you basically break that down, the obligations of countries are to develop the capacity to detect unusual outbreaks, to report these rapidly, and to be able to respond and contain them. Uh, now, I mean, Sri Lanka has shown that uh, it, is, it has been able to do that, but globally, uh, you know, the preparedness level is, is really poor. So that is one issue uh, and, and really needs to be ramped up. And I think after the Ebola crisis, there were a number of uh, international commissions that looked into, you know, what, what went wrong with Ebola, which actually <laughs> it was very, very mild compared to what has gone uh, gone wrong here. Uh, but then there's another major issue, and that is that the countermeasures, I think um, uh, the first speaker pointed out the importance of countermeasures, such as uh, treatments, diagnostics, and vaccines. Now, countermeasure development for emerging infectious diseases, uh, the, the existing models of international pharma 
and the international diagnostic chains do not work because who is going to uh, spend money to develop a vaccine to SARS or to MERS, shall we say, you know, potential emerging threats, when nobody knows whether it will become a, a, a pandemic or, 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 or really, you know, whether you can recoup your, your, your funding. So, so there's a huge problem in how, uh, I mean, many of us could see this coming indeed. <laughs> I mean, I'm on record as, as saying that the next major problem uh, pandemic-wise, either going to be influenza or a coronavirus. But the, the countermeasure development has been very slow for the reasons I mentioned. So we really need completely different models to respond to this. And I would recommend, you know, after, after Ebola, there was a, a global, uh, the National Academy of Medicine in the United States set up a commission uh, and reported on what needs to be done. And, and that's a very useful report, I think, uh, over. Thank you very much, Prof. Saroj. Uh, yeah. I think uh, this one particular yeah, one area which uh, Sri Lanka also should handle is or consider seriously is uh, this One Health approach because uh, all the factors for an epidemic starting off in Sri Lanka also there. I mean, we can't say that this is going to this is only going to happen in China. We can, this very well can happen even in Sri Lanka. So at, uh, the SLMA has already taken up uh, uh, to have some discussions, and uh, we had a pre-Congress meeting with the Veterinary Association. So I think that's uh, the correct way to move forwards, and I think that's something we have to work on. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saroj and uh, Professor Malik and Professor Manoj. Uh, I think uh, that is a, uh, uh, you know, that is a pertinent way to end this session to think about the One Health approach and how we can take it forward. So we end this uh, symposium uh, with uh, several burning questions, but with a silver lining and. Uh, to take forward a multi-sectoral One Health approach. So thank you very much uh, for all the speakers. Uh, let us thank them in the traditional manner and uh, conclude the symposium.